listening? It is I, Numator 479. According to our studies of your puny mammalian race, we discovered you like very good coffee. And while it is our evolutionary purpose to cause you psychic torment, we want you awake and vivacious to give it. So try our new blend from Spring Hill Jack Coffee, reptilian in the morning. Our proprietary blend of lightly roasted cocayo husks will have you immediately energized upon emerging from the pain cloaca with all your slippery new eggs. Thanks, honey. Hot, hot, I'm cold blooded. Mmm. Ah. Eggs to Spring Hill Jack and last podcast on the left. I'm ready to get out there and eat some babies. Get out of the way, Hillary Clinton. There's no place to escape to. This is the last podcast. On the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. So I hope that for today's episode, are we, do, are we ready? We're oh, ready. I'm and, and I'm ready to hear your hopes. I'm um, sitting here. Your dreams. I hope, because I know what I did today, was that I kissed my puppies. Okay. I had a big, hot plate of food. Mm-hmm. Um, and I turned up the heat. I made it 85 degrees in that. Yeah. <laughs> Just so that I could, because this story, what? it freaks me out. <laughs> I'd imagine. It really freaks me out. And I just... I hope the audience is hungry. Yeah, I was watching it live, and I literally ordered Postmates, and I felt so guilty. Yeah, yeah how easy it was. <laughs> can, you well, imagine it, what, can you imagine the different tone of the movie if it was alive with an exclamation point like fame? Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Welcome to Last Podcast on the Left, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marcus Parks. I'm here with Henry Zabrowski. I'm alive! And Ed Larson. Partially alive. <laughs> <laughs> reasonably alive and unreasonably warm to do this episode. Yeah, let's take man, pop your shirt off. We'll get some ice in here. Oh Rob, let's get some buckets of ice. We can just pour it around that place because things are about to get a little chilly. Oh yeah, boys are talking about the cold because today we are talking about survival in the Andes. The story of the Uruguayan rugby team. I'm alive! <laughs> and it's rugby, not soccer, no matter what all of our childhood cartoons try to tell us. Yeah, I could have sworn it was soccer. <laughs> yeah, I think this might be another Mandela effect thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Where yeah. called just being wrong? It's yeah. just called being oh, wrong. It's yeah, called like... Just, it's never like, looking it it's up, called, never correcting yourself. It's called yeah. one Simpsons writer not rem- remembering a movie wrong. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but best known from the 1993 movie... Alive! <laughs> The story of the Uruguayan rugby team who spent 72 days in the unforgiving heights of the Andes Mountains is one of the most harrowing tales of survival on record. Can I? All right. So when we talked about with the Donner Party, you know, when you went from, oh, no, is my shoe untied to, oh, holy shit, there's a spider in my colostomy bag. What (laughs) level of stress would you put this compared to the Donner Party? I put this maybe only because of length of time spent surviving. It's like close to number two because when we yeah. covered the US USS Indianapolis that was just three days very concentrated horror because you had yeah. constant sharks all at once right yeah. a bunch of fucked up shit all happened at once same mm-hmm. thing when we did the Essex a lot of shit happened at once yes they did turn out long but I, I don't know there's something about this I don't know why because cold versus hot yeah. I'd much rather be hot than cold I go either way you know cold's good I like it I, you know I run hot you know, so it helped me sleep. Yeah, no, I just sleep <laughs> so nice. And I run cold, so I'm not going to do well at all. It'd yeah. be hell on earth. So, what do you, but what do you think? What, which one would I rather do, Essex well, or Alive? Well, just in terms I'd much of like, rather do Alive than Essex. Worst survival story. Worst survival that we've story. Either covered or we could cover. I believe that this is up there, probably number two. Uh, the way that they describe the cold uh, is one of the most. I, I would say scariest things that I've ever like read because I think the plane crash itself, all right, but the mm-hmm. cold and cold for the length of time that they had to endure it, that I think would be the worst for me. You're fine with the airplane crash. <laughs> I'm fine with the airplane crash, and I'm oddly- You're fine with the airplane crash. <laughs> it happens. What are you going to do? It it's happens. out of my control. It fucking happens. <laughs> Especially in the Andes with a fucking shitty-ass plane. <laughs> well, the basic facts that- Wait, uh, before we get too far, I have to ask the hacky question. 
who's most delicious. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> Certainly not you. I'll tell you that. No, out it's of not. Marcus. Out of the three of us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I'm absolutely the most delicious. I'm the They're leanest just, meat. No, Let's no, move on. And we're going to pick this back up. Dress as a man. You're all incorrect. <laughs> we'll pick this back up. <laughs> the basic facts that on October 12th, 1972, a Fairchild F-227 left on a charter flight from the South American country of Uruguay with 45 souls aboard. Their destination was an exhibition rugby match in Santiago, Chile, which meant crossing one of the largest mountain ranges in the world. But while the purpose of the flight was a rugby game, the majority of the passengers on board were not on the team. It's like they were trying to travel, go play a rugby game, but instead all they found was nothing, nothing but trouble. trouble. Nothing yeah, trouble. nothing trouble. Yeah, it's Good. too bad. <laughs> <laughs> also, like, for you flying to an exhibition game, just practice at home. It's a long <laughs> story. <laughs> it's a long story. I didn't want to get into, like, the full story. Sorry, of, I'm sorry. Well, I mean, because they're they're playing exhibition. It's an exhibition game, but they're, they're the best fucking rugby team in all of Uruguay, mm-hmm. so they go and play exhibition games against other countries. Well, only 15 of the passengers were players, while the rest were friends, family, or people who hopped on the charter flight last minute for a cheap ride to Chile. But as we all know, the plane never made it to its destination. What? <laughs> 16 of the 45 people who crashed in the Andes would leave the mountains alive. Although I hesitate to say only 16 when I talk about the number of survivors. Talk about the number to the top 16 people yeah. <laughs> that you want on any one of your teams ever. Yeah. <laughs> like these guys are talk about survivors. Yeah. They put the fucking, it does make them the best rugby team of all time. It I, does, think. I believe. <laughs> yeah. Well, put simply, it's an absolute miracle that anyone survived even the crash, much less what came after. These people spent nearly two and a half months. Months. M- months. <laughs> months. Yes, months. They spent nearly two and a half months near the top of one of the most unforgiving mountain ranges in the world. And the only certainty they had as far as their location went was that they were in the Andes and they were in South America. And we're not talking about the Richters because if you were inside of an Andy Richter, it'd be super warm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you'd be able to eat a lot more. Yeah, fun. <laughs> fun <stuff. laughs> But since this was to be a short flight, relatively so, there was little food. And since the plane was colored white, as most planes are, there was little to no hope that rescue planes would spot them. Therefore, the survivors were infamously forced to eat the dead to sustain themselves throughout their ordeal. (laughs) I know just any time I say eat the dead. Yeah, I mean, that's just I feel like I'm doing a trailer for like a 1977 fucking horror movie. But these guys did it. Right. They did classy. Yeah, they did very classy. Yeah. It is, however, important to make a distinction here. What these people engaged in was not technically cannibalism, as cannibalism has a ritualistic element to it and usually involves murder. Yeah, yeah. you sick fucks. <laughs> yeah. How fucking dare you? Yeah. Rather, these men engaged in what's known as anthropophagy, which is the simple consummation of human flesh. It's simple. That's it. <laughs> yeah, it's just eating human flesh. You don't kill anybody. It's not a part of a whole thing. You just eat it. Does Carolina shop at anthropophagy? Or- <laughs> <laughs> I heard Ethan Hawke prepared for the role by eating his girlfriend's ass. Yeah. (laughs) White as hell in this very, very uh, Hispanic environment. My God, we were watching a live the other day, and it's like, if the cast members aren't white, they're Italian. Hey, that's that's not white. Yeah. (laughs) Italy is the South America of Europe. (laughs) Uh, That's controversial. (laughs) But, you know, that's why we can say that members of the Donner Party were cannibals. Because some of them did kill in order to survive. That's what ticks Donner Party to the number one slot. Yeah. Is the actual, like, human machinations against each other and the group get divided. But meanwhile, this story is about truly the power of the human spirit. Yeah. But that was fueled by human meat. Isn't the Donner Party, correct me if I'm wrong, like, they got in trouble because they were kind of stupid? They, yeah. they definitely yeah. 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 tried to like take a totally shortcut. an accident. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's because one person was stupid. Yes. yes. But so he, the rest of them are completely blameless. Yeah. 
But concerning the survivors, one of the biggest factors when it came to how they survived was the fact that they were already a team. Yeah. And a rugby team at that. Yeah, grabbing and tussling. <laughs> big ball. You got a big ball. That's going to be fun. Yeah. I'm not playing rugby. <laughs> no. I'd I bruise easy. I, I would I, love to play. I'm so sad I missed that train. I know. I much would have rather have done that than football. You, rugby over football? Yeah, we used to play. That's the funny thing. We used to play a form of rugby when I was a kid, but we called it caveman football. Man, people got so hurt. We yeah, like I seven on seven or something? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, it was just fucking just ripping into kids well, as hard as you can. They also get less concussions because they don't wear helmets and they know not to hit each other's heads. Yep. Yep. Fucking rugby. <laughs> well, that's all to say that these Bunch guys... bags. <laughs> Cute. <laughs> that's good merch. That's good merch. Rugby merch. Yeah. If we had a rugby team, that'd be incredible. But that's all to say that these guys were in competition shape. They knew how to work together. And at least the team were all between the ages of 18 and 26. They were young dudes. Tight. Mm -hmm. But since these were young men, they acted like it. Meaning they were sometimes petulant, annoying, and selfish, in addition to being incredibly fucking heroic. I think it's one of those beautiful it slash devastating things that, like, Nando talked a little bit about this in one of the documentaries about how, like, they all talk about, like, oh, like, you know... A lot of people said if they were in this situation, they don't know if they could do it. And Nando was kind of saying the same thing, being like, "It's you would never know yeah. if you could do it or not unless you're put in this situation. And there was something about them just being boys that saved them yeah. because it was like, it for some reason, it wasn't as devastating. They literally just got up every day and came up with new plans and did new shit and they were constantly on the move. It sounded exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> I'd much rather do it with strangers than watch my friends die. Though. But the strangers aren't going to work together. I mean, you see Lost, it took them forever and they were on an island full of food. That's true. Yeah. You ever yeah. see the show Survivor where that one guy got naked all the time? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. Talk and, about eating meat. And yes, I know I got the numbers wrong in the last side stories. It's 4, 8, 15, 16, 23, 42. I know that. I know that now. It bothered me for days. Rob is, is throwing a fist in the air. Apparently, he was a part of the throng of people. <laughs> I didn't even hear of a throng. I just came off of the episode and I went, fuck, fuck. It's 4 8, <laughs> not 9 10. But because they were young kids, that also meant they could be fucking playful. They joked around. They were even cheerful at times, if only to ease the burden of the situation. They were also jocks and they came from well to do families. Not all of them, but a lot of them. But all that's to say is that these people were very human. And this is a story of human survival at its absolute peak, if you'll excuse the pun. Thank you. I will not. I love it. I was like when Natalie and I went into a Twin Peaks restaurant thinking it was the David Lynch theme, but it was oh just about God. tits. <laughs> I'll have the pancakes, please. <laughs> but since there were a fair amount of survivors, the story is well known and well told. And those who talk about it are often brutally honest about what they and others did during those 72 days. I do think that this is also one of the very rare occurrences where the big Hollywood movie was actually pretty spot on when it came to the events that kind of happened in sequence. Like, yeah. obviously the characterizations, they make it up for dramatic effect, but there are certain things that you watch them do where, like, they knew a lot about what actually went down. Yeah. Now, we, of course, used Alive by Pierre Paul, <laughs> by Pierre Paul <laughs> Reed as our main source for this series. But the world is also fortunate enough to have two books from the two men who eventually got everyone rescued. Those books are Miracle in the Andes by Nando Parado and I Had to Survive. I Had to Survive. By Roberto Canessa. Out of the two, Nando's is the higher recommendation because Canessa spends quite a few pages writing about his career as a highly successful pediatric cardiologist. I love to look at kids. I like to open them up. I like to get down in their rib cage. That's my favorite part of the job is seeing them hovering between life and death. It's kind of, honestly, his book kind of sounds like, well, what's the movie that they wanted to make? about Freddie Mercury and Queen that What's-His-Name wanted to make, the guitar player. Oh, that Brian, Brian May wanted Brian to make? Brian May wanted the movie, or the original script apparently had Freddie Mercury die in the first like quarter of the film, and the rest was the resilience of the rest of Queen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, uh, sorry, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. call up the guy from Bad Company yeah. and talk him into singing with us. <laughs> <laughs> it was easy. <laughs> And so, without further ado, let's get into the story of the old Christian rugby club and how they managed to survive the Andes Mountains. Ah, ah. There was no birds up yeah, there. Yeah, there no, no birds. Oh, it was oh. fucking barren wilderness. Sorry. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah, at least they didn't get attacked by wolves. <laughs> at least. But or then they would have had something to yeah. eat. Well, if the wolf came? Yeah. Yeah, that would have been nice. You're right. Mm, okay. 
all taken back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like dogs. <laughs> Now, while it may seem like it wouldn't be a large distinction, the fact that these guys were a rugby team as opposed to, say, a soccer team does have some bearing on how they were able to work together to survive. The survivors definitely said that. Yeah. The old Christian team, the best in Uruguay, was established by two Irish Catholic missionaries called the Christian Brothers who discouraged soccer in their school because they believed it promoted selfishness and egotism. Yeah, it made the women too horny. <laughs> Use you your have hands already, around. you fucking idiots. Yeah, whatever, man. <laughs> Soccer guys get enough. <laughs> Therefore, they pushed their students towards rugby, which taught self-discipline, devotion, sacrifice, trust, tenacity, yeah. and toughness. In other words, the principles and methods you learn in rugby are far more useful in a survival situation than, say, rolling around on the ground pretending that you're hurt. Yeah, fuck yeah, yeah shots yeah. fired. Coming <laughs> yeah. for you, soccer. You fucking idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Because only have a thing with a lot of rugby really is like guys operating as a group. Oh, yeah. It's a lot of it's a, it's the big uh the big scrums. Well, yeah. they also say like there's also a term of like a man becoming grass. Like if a guy falls down, he's grass, but it becomes the job of the other players to sacrifice yourself to protect the guy who's fallen down. Yeah. yeah. And you like push guys and lift them. You almost carry the dude and the ball to the fucking end zone. Yeah. I don't know what they call it, but I call it an end zone. It's yeah. basically an end zone. for lack of a better yeah. word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, as Nando Parado later put it, their rugby training was a big part of why they survived, especially when you consider that a lot of these guys have been playing on the same team for nearly a decade at the time of the crash. But in 1972, all of these guys were out of school, and the team included guys who were relatively new. Now, the flight had been chartered from the Uruguayan Air Force, but the plane used for the flight was not what you'd call up to Air Force standards. So why... Was it there? Because <laughs> it's used to transfer rugby teams. I guess you just decide you'll keep it instead of throwing it out. Well, they bought it from the United States government. Uh, You're welcome, Uruguay. <laughs> <laughs> the team, their guests, and a few strangers had taken off in a Fairchild F-227. And it was called, in a couple of documentaries, it was called the Lead Sled. Not my favorite nickname for the plane I'm about to be on. <laughs> Might as well be called the Bobbin for, bobbin for Body Parts. <laughs> like, you'd be like, oh, great. <laughs> well, out of the 78 Fairchild 227s built, 23 of them crashed. I just... <laughs> Feel like we got to look at it. Yeah, was it would... flown by Harrison Ford? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got to was... get back to Callista. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't even like they crashed and they're like, oh, fuck, we should probably take these out of circulation. 23 of them crashed between 1960 and 2002. Oh, my God. Yeah. They K didn't stop using these freaking things? Killed almost 400 people. Oh, Jesus, Jesus Christ. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know what, I guess, what do they get out of it? I guess when people already paid for it, they're just going to let them go until they explode? I suppose so. I mean, I think just some people take what they can get. Uh, and flying used to be a lot more dangerous than it is now. Yes. So much more dangerous than it is now. But the plane's safety record was only half of the equation here. While the pilot had flown the dangerous route through the Andes 29 times, the co-pilot was relatively inexperienced. In the end, I'd say it was like an 80-20 split between pilot error and a shitty plane that resulted in the crash. Yes. Now, flying through the Andes is dangerous no matter what, but it's more dangerous if you fly at the wrong time. That's because the air from the warm Argentinian plains mixes with the cold air of the Andes, creating incredible turbulence. If a plane got caught in a particularly bad pocket, they could easily lose control and crash into the side of a mountain. I did a little bit of research into plane crashes in general which is bad for me, <laughs> right? Because I, this is- I can't you know, believe you're actually scared of flights. It's just anything. They don't crash in America anymore. It's just, you're just, <laughs> you're just <laughs> killing hundreds of people. It's a great episode for the travel season, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I'm, um, about, I'm about to get on a plane like uh, uh, six days from now. Soon, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it, uh, wow. Because normally if <laughs> you, you have- a Delta? Yeah. That you're yeah. fine. Most of the time. <laughs> you're not going to want to pay out. You're knock, not going to die. Knock, your, knock, your down. <laughs> knock on the table again. Yeah. Knock on the fucking table again. All right? I don't care how Italian this is. <laughs> and, but it, apparently, like, from what I'm reading, the main issue, because I've now read three different testimonies that talked about what you really want to look for, which is it's not the up and down uh, turbulence, and it's not the side to side turbulence. It is a slow vibration that begins to increase in its strength. Oh, that okay. is how you know 
you're about to die in an airplane. The straight down <laughs> too is usually a bad yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh! it's, yeah, it's the pilot running out with the other pilot's severed head in his hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> with a parachute on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Taking my friend Wilson with me. <laughs> well, the dangerous nature of flying through the Andes was a fact well known to the pilots because once the charter flight got to the point where they had to decide whether or not to cross the Andes, they landed in the Argentinian city of Mendoza to wait out the unfavorable conditions. The team and everyone else on board, however, wanted their full five days in Santiago. And this is the full, this is the problem with being young. Yeah. This is the main issue with being young. Because mm-hmm. if you if you had landed it before we got to the mountains and everyone's going to be like, oh, you know, I don't know if we're going to make it over. And they're all talking about this. I would have been like, let's stay here. <laughs> Especially as a 39-year-old man with a lot of loose. I'd yeah, be yeah. like, let's, let's, let's just stay right here. Yeah. Okay, we don't go over there. And because you're not 18, you're like, yeah, man, fucking cool. Bounces are cool. It's yeah. like, no, it's not, dog. Mm-hmm. It's so scary as fuck. Yeah, wow. he just knows a chick over there or something. Yeah, she'd be like, fucking, she could die next week. Actually, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. It's like there were a couple of dudes like, man, I got some sweet Chilean tail on the other side of those mountains. <laughs> no, you don't, bro. I've seen the movie, dude. You're not alive in it. So after spending a night in Mendoza, the impatient and determined passengers were called back to the airport. There, they discovered that the pilots still weren't sure whether or not it was safe to fly. Additionally, Argentinian law forbade international military craft from resting in their country for more than 24 hours. So the choice was to risk the Andes or go back to Uruguay. Well, instead, what you do is you you ask for forgiveness because at times if your uh, troops are bordering another person's country, they give you, send you a warning, and you only say just passing through, that's also a good way to lie because mm-hmm. then you start attacking a super vulnerable city. Wow. You're thinking about Civilization Six again, aren't you? but after a cargo pilot who'd just flown in from Santiago told them that conditions were fine and after a lot of pressure from the passengers the pilots decided to go for it you know what I think this is a bad idea and I'm completely in charge but uh Fuck it. <laughs> Literally that to me, like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm horny too. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Can I watch you fuck? Can I watch you fuck? <laughs> wow, Captain Harrison's fun. <laughs> and so everyone boarded, only slightly concerned that it just happened to be Friday the 13th. Shh. <laughs> the problem, though, was that since they'd spent so much time him and Han, the plane took off at 2 p.m. This meant that the plane would be entering the Andes during the afternoon, which was the exact time that the aforementioned winds created the worst turbulence. Additionally, the Fairchild couldn't handle flying the direct east-to-west route over the mountains because its maximum cruising altitude was lower than the highest summits, which sat at 22,831 feet above sea level. That'd be a thing you want to communicate to a couple of pilots. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, they, t- they knew what they were doing. They was like, oh, they no. They didn't we- know. No, no, they knew. They knew. But, like, you know, if they knew, they'd still be alive. They might. Or maybe not. They'd probably be dead. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the pilots charted a path south to the Planchon Pass, where they could fly through the mountains before turning north to Santiago once they reached the town of Curico on the other side. But even so, the flight was only supposed to take an hour and a half. But for reasons that are still unclear, the pilot made the fateful decision to turn north in the middle of the mountain range, as opposed to waiting until they were flying over Chile. I, we couldn't really find any reason why. No one knows. Yeah. yeah. Additionally, the pilot mysteriously radioed air traffic control and told them that they'd flown over the town of Corico long before they would have done so. Side stories, LPOTL at gmail.com. I know we have a lot of pilot listeners because I have heard about this, with that the getting lost in the air Sounds terrifying. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, and yeah. this is before we had true, like, modern instruments inside of the plane, I believe. Like, they're not digitally connected. There's no GPS paying. No there's drum no, machine. There's, yeah, none of that. <laughs> no, 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 no this is like, room. Yeah, this is like 10 no years before plunge. the 808s out. Yeah, man. yeah like, none fucking, of that, no, no fucking heavy bass. But it's like, all of this, so uh, they, ha- I believe you have to do it the old fashioned way. I believe it's by speed angle with the maps and you point to where you're supposed to hit at certain time periods and that there it sounds like and it please email side stories lpotl gmail.com if you know like what would that take to get lost like that because i know it's just visual sometimes you could just look up and you think you're going one way but if the plane's been kind of slightly pointed in the wrong direction going a couple hundred miles per hour and then you're in a vastly different spot but you didn't know because maybe you weren't 
fully involved. Or like, it sounded like the plane was kind of distracted. Yeah. Like people were yelling and screaming and shit. Yeah. And the yeah. kids were like doing horseplay. Yeah, there's a lot of horseplay. But if you're a pilot, you need to be able to overcome Settle horseplay. Settle down! Yeah. <laughs> Is there a door between the yeah. them and the... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a... It's a so no. this should be fine. Yeah, it's a regular plane. It's just a charter plane, yeah. It was owned by the military, but it's just, it's a regular ass plane. Fly from your grave. Well, air traffic control, therefore, once the pilot said, hey, we're over this town, they told the pilot to lower their elevation from 18,000 feet to 10,000. And that's where the turbulence began. Now, it was light at first, expected even. <laughs> but once the Fairchild entered a cloud bank, <laughs> the turbulence became unbearable. <laughs> The plane rumbled and shook, dropping hundreds of feet at a time. But since the rugby team was basically a bunch of shithead kids, one of the players in the back of the plane grabbed the flight attendant's microphone and told everyone to put on their parachutes because they were about to crash in the Andes. Hey, man, love that guy. Yeah. Got jo to. Joke bomb. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody yeah. liked it. Been you know, there. <laughs> you gotta take a swing. You know, I got no problem with this. What this is my one function in this group. That's what I be telling <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm the funny one on the sports team because I'm not very good, but you guys like me around. Yeah. If you had if you had a shot at this joke, what would you say? Everyone, you know, put your uh, steel on. What's his name's joke? Uh, the the great the great comedian, uh, the Red Fox. You know, you put your legs between your head and, and kiss, kiss your, your ass, ass goodbye. goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now the joke bombed, as I said, but the team still wasn't taking the situation seriously. They tossed a rugby ball around the cabin. They did a bit of the ole 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 cheer, and because the plane was so up and down, up and down, they started chanting conga conga conga. conga. Conga, 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 conga. Which is fun. Yeah. But not when everybody dies. Inappropriate. Yeah. It's inappropriate, but it's much better than screaming and jerking <laughs> off. You know, you know like, what I have? Because nothing is worse. Have you ever been like that on a plane where you've had like a dip and someone goes, ah! Like screams. Real I recently hard. had a woman next to me was like having panic attacks the entire flight, and I literally had to hold her hand for a while. No, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. and you're just yeah. like, Shut it was like, up. it's fine, lady. Don't worry about and it. And then go Del to. I said the same thing, sir. I'm like, Delta will not let us die because they won't pay the money. They don't want to be sued. <laughs> they don't want to pay our families. Suddenly, though, the plane emerged from the clouds and everyone expected to see the verdant green valleys of Chile. Instead, passengers looked out their windows to see a snow-covered mountain not 10 feet from the tip of their wing as the plane kept bouncing. And it felt sort of like the bit that we did from Bees and Murder Fist, mm -hmm. where it really feels like the, the guys were looking at me like, huh. We supposed to be that close to the mountaintop? Yeah. Then, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. People would like turn as you go like, hey, is this normal? And they're like, to... no, it's not. Now, the pilots were up front trying to take control, but the turbulence and the periodic drops in altitude, <laughs> along with the fact that they were now flying in the mountains, <laughs> was too much for them to handle. Yeah, man, this ain't the fucking Death Star run. <laughs> Finally, as everyone started praying, they felt the plane vibrate as the pilots desperately tried to pull up. They'd seen a pass far too narrow for the plane to clear. And with a deafening crash, the right wing hit the mountain, broke off, somersaulted over the fuselage, and completely cut off the tail. Yeah, the plane just like fell apart midair. Immediately, the flight attendant, the navigator, and three members of the rugby team, including the one who made the joke, were sucked out of the back and fell to their deaths. Karma. Funny one always dies early. That's right. Seconds later, the left wing also broke off, along with its propeller, which sliced the leg off of one of the passengers on its way through. God. All that was left now was the fuselage, which had become, in essence, a bullet hurtling towards the Andes Mountains at an estimated 230 miles per hour. This is probably where the lead sled part of it really kind of helped. Because <laughs> it, it shot over the mountain. They all talk about it, too. It's like there was this moment in time of, like, they're now flying with just air shooting all over them around them, strapped in. And they're all like, some of them have enough wherewithal to, if they weren't strapped in already, it was just something about just being sitting in the front of the plane where they were okay because it ripped off the back half first. Yeah. And so they buckled up and they just watch it in total silence. Just until it hits the fucking mountainside yeah. that just sleds like, like your fucking, uh, what's it from the fucking, um, 
Rescue Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> Tailspin. Tailspin. <laughs> Please. But in an extraordinary piece of luck, the fuselage did not spin, nor did it crash into a cliff face. Instead, it landed on its belly in a steep valley at just the right angle where it didn't tumble end over end. Because if it would have done that, the whole thing would have oh, just over. fucking killed everyone's, everybody. Everyone's, everyone's dead. But two more players were sucked out of the back when the fuselage hit the ground. But after it tobogganed 400 yards down the valley at 125 miles per hour, it finally came to a stop when it crashed into a snow berm. What's a berm? Uh, I think it's a pile. You know, a berm, you know, like uh, at Disneyland, they have a berm that's like what keeps you from seeing the outside world. It's like a big, like almost like a sand dune oh, that wow. keeps you, like, that keeps everything inside. Yeah, cool. it just is the linear accumulation of a snow cast aside by a plow. Nice. But the force of the impact ripped the seats loose and crushed the passengers in the front like a folding accordion, killing four almost instantly. The crash was over, but the ordeal was just beginning. Now, this is where you read a lot about for plane crash survivors. It's just got to be harrowing. I don't know if you've ever seen that Werner Herzog documentary talking about the woman who fell from the plane. No. In her seat, she fell from something like 10,000 feet, and she survived. Like, she managed to get caught in this tree. She, like, lived in her seat. It's fucked but that she, and then she saw like she looked around and she saw other people that were stuck in the ground feet up like literally like Jeez, fucking javelins yeah. it's like it's a crazy documentary but they all say they all everything i read was all about the the silence after a plane crash is insane yeah where you're just like what because you just went from twenty thousand feet in the air you're just like on the ground yeah. and you're alive like because it's weird a lot of these guys were like not hurt at all yeah now, once the passengers inside started getting some semblance of a bearing, they saw that the cabin was covered in blood. They looked forward to the seats that had been compressed together. All they saw was a jumble of arms and legs just motionlessly sticking out. In the first of many miracles, a player named Gustavo Zerbino had stood up during the crash and held on to the luggage rack above him, just as the seat he was sharing with a friend zipped out of the hole behind. Zerbino was still standing, totally uninjured, when the plane came to a stop. And from his recollection, his first thought was that, oh, it's true that you can still think after you're dead. Yeah, dude, it happened. That's what they're saying. It happened so fast, and the shock is so intense. It's crazy because he literally just hung on for dear life. Yeah. But so fucking badass. Yeah, no, man, it's like, fucking just like, crazy. Just like, like, like. Like a paraglider. We yeah. gotta work on this shit, dude. We gotta work on it because I I can't really do many pull ups. I can pull myself up, <laughs> sort of. We gotta work on this, man. But Gustavo was alive, while everyone and everything behind him had completely disappeared into the mountains. In all, seven people had been sucked out of the back of the airplane and fallen to their deaths when the tail of the airplane had been severed. Later, some of these corpses would be found still strapped into their seats, and one would be found burned to a crisp because he had been ignited by engine fuel mid-air. Fortunately for everyone who survived, though, Gustavo Zerbino was a first-year medical student, so he began checking pulses. Yeah, he became doctor of the crew. Yeah, well, he became one of the two doctors of the crew, because in another piece of luck, the first living person Zerbino found was Roberto Canesa, who was a second-year medical student. This also saved fucking everyone. Yeah. They got to work freeing more people, but before long, they became acutely aware of the scent of fuel. In fact, survivor Roy Harley was completely blue because he was covered in airplane fuel. And to make matters worse for Roy, this was his first time on an airplane. Did you say, <laughs> next time, let's take a bus. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also not uncommon in South America at all to fly between cities and, yeah, and to fly in between countries like because it's jumpers. through the mountains. You yeah. know, you just, it's very common. Because you're not walking, you're not busing. There's no roads, especially not, back not, then. Not through those huge mountain ranges like yeah. that. You have to find them. But once they smelled fuel, those who were free fled the wrecked fuselage thinking that it might blow at any second. That, however, is when they realized just how much trouble they were really in. Yeah, they didn't realize they were trouble before. Now it's there's in, there are more trouble. Yeah. See, since all this occurred in the southern hemisphere, their seasons are switched. So October in this section of the Andes still had a month and a half of winter to go with all of the blizzards and dangers that went along with that. Conversely, the winters in Uruguay and Chile are relatively mild. So most of the passengers were in T-shirts 
At most, some were wearing blazers, so the passengers weren't even prepared for a chilly fall day, much less an environment where it was 10 below zero. <sighs> Those who ran out of the plane found themselves thigh deep in snow, facing a cold that was so brutal. And this is what scares me. This is how Nando Parado put it, how he explained it. The cold penetrated the bones and scalded the skin as if it was acid, making each moment seem to last an eternity. Not good. Yeah. Send me to Miami. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be here. No, there was. they said that there was at one point, like one of the guys had a watch and they would ask him like, hey, what time is it? And he'd tell them and they'd feel like hours had gone by, hours upon hours upon hours. And they'd say, like, okay, hey, what time is it? And two minutes would have passed. Yeah, very, very Damn. bad. Yeah. I don't like the cold. To make matters worse, and that's a phrase I'm going to use a lot over the next two episodes. Just keeps okay. happening, man. This winter in the Andes had been the most severe on record. Below their feet was a hundred feet of snow, and more would come soon enough. Now, the first person to take control of the situation was Team Captain Marcelo Perez. And this is one of those things I find interesting about humanity in general, is that he was just the captain of the rugby team. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting how when you're young... yeah. You fall into these like, ro these like pre-described roles almost in a way where you're like, well, he's captain, yeah. So let's just follow what the captain says, and he just like got everybody in order in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I was on a Greyhound bus that got stuck in the snow, and I like became the captain of the bus. I see yeah, that. Yeah, I yeah, can yeah, see yeah. that. Just, yeah. Like, yeah. All right, I'm captain of the bus. <laughs> I literally was like, all right, because their wheels were spinning. I was like, someone grab a rug, stick it under the wheel. Like, it was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you guys get in the back and push. I mean, we got we couldn't get out of there. No, yeah, no, but, no, but, no, but you fun. tried. You tried something. <laughs> and the guy who kept snoring, I wouldn't let go back to sleep. Just was, <laughs> you wake up. <laughs> <laughs> well, once it became apparent that the fuselage wasn't going to explode, Marcelo got the other boys to work freeing those who weren't trapped underneath the seats. This introduced another problem, because even though these boys were the best rugby team in Uruguay, they struggled for every breath in the thin mountain air. But as they found more people, they realized just how badly some of them were hurt. Nando Parado's sister, for example, had blood pouring from her head and blood pouring out of one of her eyes while Nando himself was seemingly near death. His head had swollen to the size of a basketball. That's because he was full of himself. <laughs> <laughs> he's our hero. He's our guy. <laughs> Nando's our fucking, he's a G, dude. I take he's, it back, Nando. Yeah. I'm sorry. So Nando was carried along with the other severely injured passengers to the back of the plane, basically to die. Nando had also brought along his mother, who'd been one of the four crushed to death in the crash. Yeah, he brought his like whole family on that one little flight. Mm -hmm. The most incredible survivor was a player named Enrique Paltero, who approached med student Gustavo Zerbino and pointed towards his torso. You know, it doesn't hurt here so much. <laughs> or here so much. But it hurts like right here. <laughs> he had a steel tube sticking out of his stomach. What do I do with this? I have a handle now. <laughs> Knowing that a doctor had to instill confidence in his patient, Gustavo told Enrique, You're all right. You're going to be all right. <laughs> You're fine. Don't worry, buddy. And surprisingly, Enrique took Gustavo at his word. But when Enrique turned away, Gustavo grabbed the steel tube and just yanked it out <laughs> and brought six inches of intestine along with yeah, it. Yeah, not good. The other med student, Roberto Canesas, quickly tucked the intestines back inside the wound and wrapped the injury with a rugby jersey. Gustavo then told Enrique that, You're not doing great. But <laughs> something that's inside of you is outside of you. And a lot of times we don't like that, right? Unless yeah. it's shit, cum, or piss, <laughs> which we love. But if it's your intestine, if it's a part of the infrastructure, yeah. but apparently you can just live like that. Yeah, yeah, because that's the thing. He told him, he's like, hey, you're not doing great, but there's a lot of people worse off than you, so I need your help. So I'm guessing the intestines didn't rip as much as they just got yanked out a little bit. I mean, I'm sure they got nicked. Yeah, yeah. it's not good. Yeah. So, moments after his intestines had been stuffed back into his body, Enrique bucked up, did what he was told, and started helping whoever he could. Fuck yeah, man. Yeah, Rugby. Yeah, yeah, man. And to it, get his cardio up, he'd let out a length of it, and he'd just start <laughs> jumping. <laughs> like, 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 yeah, just to kind of get work up the, the, for the entire time. And he would have hours counting his jumps. Now, a lot of survivors only had minor injuries, but those who had broken legs or injured arms were sent outside to plunge their limbs into the snow to help with the pain and prevent swelling. I'm going to dip my balls in it. <laughs> 
perfect state reference. <laughs> the only woman to survive the crash without injuries was Liliana Mathal. I think it's Mathal. Yeah. It's hmm. a d- difficult name. There's a, there's a fair amount of difficult Mithol. names at Mathal. Yes. Yeah. But her husband, Javier, had survived as well. Tragically, they were just fans of the team who decided to pair the exhibition match with a nice romantic vacation in Santiago. Nothing gets me horny like a bunch of scrum bags. <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite. Roll around with that big old ball. <laughs> but unlike the others, Javier immediately succumbed to altitude sickness and was vomiting and extremely dizzy as a result. This condition would not change. For a long, long time. I was trying to look that up about, do, does your body get used to certain things? Mm-hmm. Because you, I guess you can get sort of used to altitude sickness, but I, I my main thing was about sunburn. I've always mm-hmm. wondered this, and I really haven't found any direct sort of information about it, but the idea of like, your body could eventually get used to the sun coverage. Yeah. And then even if you're like super fair, you get burnt time and time again, eventually you do get tan, but it's like, I guess your, your chances of getting cancer is like, 30% more or whatever. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, it's going to be bad. But the person who was in worse shape than anyone else out of the ones who had technically survived was Graziella Mariani, who was on her way to her daughter's wedding in Santiago. She'd been crushed by the seats, yes, but she had survived. Her chest was pressed against her knees and both of her legs had been broken when the seats crumpled together. The tangled mess of metal made it impossible to free or even move her. So all they could do was wait for her to die as she screamed in agony. But then the survivors heard moans from the cockpit where they discovered that the co-pilot had survived. Both him and the pilot had been pinned by the instrument panel when the nose of the plane crumpled, and he was definitely going to die. The pilot's already dead, but the co-pilot was at the very least conscious. And so after they removed the cushion from his seat back to relieve some of the pressure, he managed to give them an important, albeit incorrect piece of information. He should have just said nothing. <laughs> he should have just been like, the combination of the safe has. Like it could have been anything else. Tell me, uh, where is he? Where, where is, is he? he? Yeah. Who do you work the, for? He's in the... Ah, <laughs> God damn you, Dick Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> well, he told them that they'd passed Cortico. But now, as we said, they'd never gone far enough west to pass that town. But it was possible that the co-pilot's inexperience meant that he took the pilot's word for it when he'd radioed the transmission, saying that they had, in fact, passed the town to air traffic control. Or he might have also thought, yeah, we passed it. But none of the survivors had any reason to doubt the co-pilot. So they operated on the assumption that they were much further west than they actually were the rest of their ordeal. The co-pilot, of course, didn't last the night. But he did ask for one thing from his flight back. He wanted his gun so he could end his life quickly. But the survivors figured they had other priorities. I liked in this this scene in Alive where they're like, I will not be involved in this. Yeah. And they just leave. So there was a gun amongst them? No, thankfully no one found the weapon. I can only that, imagine that what kind of a, shenanigans would have gone on. That would have ruined a, everything. Oh, the, yeah, man. If there was a gun in the mix. Shoot the mountain. That's what I would have been like. <laughs> now, once the situation had been fully assessed to the best of their abilities, Team Captain Marcelo Perez began to realize that they were, at best, lightly fucked. Lightly fucked? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, buddy. I've been lightly fucked before and it's I, nice. But that's the thing. I think that people use the term fucked way too often because for me, like, fucked is like things are, I might die. They're no. fucked. <laughs> <laughs> but this is lightly fucked. Let's say relatively speaking, lightly <laughs> fucked. Since they crashed at 3.30 p.m., nobody would realize they were missing until 4 and no helicopter could fly through the Andes at night. That meant that everyone would have to spend at least one night in sub-zero temperatures wearing light summer clothing with no coats or blankets. The best they could do to protect themselves from the elements was to build a wall of suitcases, airplane fragments, and loose seats to block the open end of the fuselage. Once that was done, the survivors took full account of who lived, who died, and who was near death. Five had died instantly when the plane crashed, and two had died soon after, so those that could be reached were removed from the plane and laid outside face down in the snow. Eight more passengers were simply gone, having been sucked out of the plane while it was still in the air. One person had actually survived the fall, 
But when the survivors spotted him walking on a mountain slope a few hundred yards away and yelled out, he turned around, stumbled, fell down, and was never seen again. I don't want to die like Mr. Bean. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine living through that. And, and, then, then, just and, then, and then you go, whoop, whoop. And then, <laughs> it is. That's how thin life is <laughs> and our chances are. Yeah, it's all just a what crap shoot. Yeah. So the middle of the plane is the safest place to be. Yeah, middle so, of the plane. So f- everyone who like fought for first class died. Yep. And then everyone who was like stuck in the back Near got the, sucked out. Next to the toilet that things got worse. Yeah. All right, middle from yeah. now on. Always. <laughs> yeah. But despite the severity of the crash, 32 people were still alive when the sun set on October 13th, 1972. <laughs> Mama! <laughs> now remember, this was a relatively small <laughs> chartered plane that only held 45 people, and quite a bit of the cabin had been sliced off in the air. That left a space 20 feet long from the pilot's cabin to the rear fuselage hole and 8 feet across from window to window. Small space, and this was their only shelter. Smartly, those with relatively minor injuries decided that those with the lowest chance of survival would be placed near the suitcase wall where it was coldest. This practical decision, however, would inadvertently save the life of the man who would help save them all. If you'll remember, Nando Parado's head was swollen to frightening proportions, and his skull had been thoroughly cracked during the crash landing. Maybe I'm getting smarter. <laughs> <laughs> But since he was sent to the coldest part of the plane, his brain did not swell, and therefore he did not die. Is that real? That's real. They actually use that now as a treatment. I saw an actual doctor. And one Just of the put doc- his head on ice? <laughs> during the Won't one- Disney him. <laughs> <laughs> In one of the documentaries I saw, they talked to a doctor like, actually, today, this is what we use partly to help people whose brains are swelling. Additionally, a teammate decided on that first night to pull him just a little closer towards the mass of body heat. And the balance of warmth and cold saved Nando's life and essentially saved them all. Now, eventually, Roberto Canesa, the other man who would take the final expedition with Nando, realized that the cloth covering from the seats could be unzipped and used as makeshift blankets. These guys were crafty as all hell they were you turn crafty real fast oh yeah you yeah. know it's it's your I brain feel, just starts changing I, I still feel like i die just from cheer yeah i don't wanna we were talking about <laughs> we probably would just straight up suffocate because of how much weed we smoke and oh stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah just from the the lack of oxygen yeah. yeah but while the covers were made from nothing more than thin nylon they still heavily contributed to the survival of the passengers when it came to retaining body heat during the sub-zero nights. And here in a bit, I'll get to why weed smoking wouldn't have had any bearing whatsoever on your survival chances. All right, thank God. All right, keep yeah, doing cool. it. Yeah, cool. <laughs> thank God they already loved hugging each other, all these rugby guys. You, know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you better be yeah. already used to horseplay and grab ass, especially when it can save your life. Yeah. Pretty soon, though, the shock of the crash wore off and the panic set in. Almost everyone complained, argued, and raved throughout the night. Everyone's trying to one-up each other when it comes to whose injuries were the worst. But the most terrible element was the woman who was still folded under the seats with two broken legs. Yeah, because she's just like, you guys think your shit sucks? I'm a human accordion. (laughs) She screamed throughout the night and only shrieked louder when anyone approached her to help. Strangely, this was the reaction that a few of the injured had that night, maybe as like a sort of haywired survival mechanism. In one case, the plane's mechanic began to believe that one of the rugby players was trying to kill him. And when the player approached him, the mechanic screamed that he wanted the player to show him his papers. Then he asked him to identify himself. Identify yourself. Identify yourself. I think it is some sort of survival thing where it's like, if anyone comes near me, they're going to kill me. Well, you've lost your mind. He's already asked everyone to kill him. Yeah. No, this is the mechanic. Oh, the mechanic. Yeah, the mechanic. You know, it's... He kind of... He was... Like, you know, there's always a guy who goes a little loopy. Yeah. The mechanic was the one who went a little loopy. Yeah, I think that it it requires... I feel that that's a process of shock wearing off sometimes. Yeah. And all the while, the woman stuck in the seats continued to scream. Finally, someone lost their temper and told her that if she didn't shut up, He'd come over there and smash her face in. He later regretted that statement. I mean, someone, had, it was, you need that to stop. Well, yeah. This, this, of course, caused her to, to scream even louder. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> and that was mixed with repeated requests from the pilot for someone to find his gun. Man, he's still alive. Yeah. yeah. As one player, alive! <laughs> as one player put it, the night was comparable to Dante's hell. And by the time the sun rose the next morning, 
four more people were dead. But mixed in with the panic and horror were bizarre moments of shock. At one point in the night, even through the screaming, one player stood up and told everyone, hey, I'm going to go to the store and grab a Coke. Anybody want anything? And one of the guys like responded and said, like, yeah, grab me a mineral water while you're at it. It's, like, it actually reminds me a lot of the Dyatlov uh, past story. Maybe one day we'll do a big update on because there's mm-hmm. been new stuff that's come out about it. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I'm even saying it correct. I think it's Dyatlov. I mean, if, Dyatlov, if, if anything, Dyatlov. so people could fucking stop yelling that I kept saying it wrong. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I said we could change <laughs> it. Uh, we can change the past. Uh, but the, the idea of uh, the, the, that, that kind of hallucinatory part of being super cold and panicked. Mm-hmm. Now, while most of the survivors were hesitant to even open their eyes and face the situation when the sun came up, team captain Marcelo Perez continued his established role as the leader and got people to work. Burpees do incredible things. Mm -hmm. One night of mass panic was all they allowed himself. And while the panic would come in fits and starts, the survivors quickly realized that if they let the panic take over, all of them would die. First, the four who had died in the night were removed from the plane. But when they tried removing the pinned woman, who they thought was dead, she screamed again, but finally died later that morning. Wounds were then cleaned, dressings were changed, and instructions were given to the injured who could take care of themselves. For example, the guy whose intestines had popped out, he had his wound disinfected with cologne and was told that if anything popped out again, eh, just pop it back in. Hey, at least he's going to fucking live being sexy. (laughs) So not to be totally brutal and horrible, Hmm. like... You gotta kill that woman, right? Like she's gonna die. I like, don't. It's just bringing back, bringing down morale. There is like- a thing that there's a stripe through all of the survivors where they talk about. They're, this is they're pretty religious. Yeah, and, yeah, and they're have, very Catholic. They're very. very Catholic. It's embedded in. So a lot of them had to figure out a way of how to. Obviously, later on, what they ended up kind of not mental gymnastics, but sort of a let's just say, th- uh, th- theistic. Math. Mm-hmm. They had to figure out how to handle the uh, the quote unquote cannibalism. But uh, in terms of killing someone, I think that they were not ready to do it. They're all young boys. Yeah, these are all these young guys. Like, they don't they don't want to kill anybody. No, See, I'm more likely to kill someone 20 years ago than I am now. Okay. <laughs> Well, look, these guys were like, they were so, some of them uh, at least were like, they're good guys. They're, they're good, good guys. guys. And yeah. some of them are like so Catholic when it came to figuring out like whether or not they were going to eat people. Some of them said to themselves, if I don't eat them, it's akin to suicide because I can survive and I'm choosing not to. So if I commit suicide, if I don't eat this person that I'm going to go to hell. Wow. Yeah. It's intense. At least get some warmth. Yeah. Well, after the oh, in hell, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is actually kind of nice down here. <laughs> well, after the wounded were taken care of, the empty suitcases were arranged into a cross so the rescue helicopters they were all banking on could see them because they very quickly realized that a white fuselage laying on white snow would be impossible to see. But even though they figured rescue was coming either that day or the next, they still accounted for what food they had. In all, this is it. They had eight chocolate bars, five nougat bars, an assortment of caramels, dates, and prunes, a tin of salted biscuits, two tins of mussels, a tin of salted almonds, and a few small jars of jam. So you mean to tell me they had a year's worth of girl dinner? (laughs) (laughs) When it came to beverages... They'd already drained two of the five bottles of wine that survived the crash, but they still had a bottle of whiskey, a bottle of cherry brandy, and a bottle of creme de menthe. No water. No water. No water. But None. hey, guess what they're surrounded by? Snow. Yeah. yeah. No, they only had liquor left. But while the hope of a quick rescue was the general consensus, Team Captain Marcelo Perez insisted on rationing just in case, giving everyone just a square of chocolate and a deodorant cap full of wine. Now, seeing as how they only had a relatively small amount of liquid for 28 people, their immediate danger was death by dehydration. No, but the snow! Eh? Technically, they are surrounded by fresh water. Yeah, snow! It's frozen (laughs) water. Yeah, you gotta do something with it. The problem with eating snow is that it cracks your lips, cuts up your mouth, and quickly causes sores to develop. Man, what the fuck? So you can't (laughs) blow Frosty the snowman? (laughs) God, that's what he says. Sad. This was even more of an issue because the higher a person goes in the air, the more water they need. 
At their height in the Andes, their bodies dehydrated five times faster than normal because of the oxygen levels in the atmosphere. This is why mountain climbers carry small gas stoves so they can easily melt snow and drink the requisite amount of water. Mountain climbers are almost constantly drinking water Man, on their way up. There was this guy named Yuli Steck that I got into. It was like he's this, this dude who's into like he's an alpinist, alpinist. And so he does speed runs of mountains and he just runs up this crazy fucking shit. But he doesn't bring anything. Yeah. He doesn't bring, and it's scary, but he's, cause he's like, I, I travel fast enough. I, I do not need to drink. I do not need the old waters. And you're like, what? What the fuck, dude? <laughs> you gotta be careful. Why, r- watch that race to the summit documentary. It's wild. Dog. Oh, yeah. Well, eventually, though, a player named Adolfo Strouch, Fito to his friends, came up with an ingenious solution. Well, as a bit of a side quest, perhaps not surprisingly, Adolfo Strouch's family was from Germany. And while I don't know this for sure, I'd imagine the Strouches, who again named their son Adolfo, <laughs> I'd imagine they arrived in Uruguay sometime in the mid 1940s. But you know, I think that maybe due to some of his genetics, he'd be very good at keeping things in order. <laughs> well, we do talk in our Kraut Rock series about the uh, the wonders of German engineering. Uh. Additionally, Adolfo and his cousin Eduardo Strauch, they were both blonde, and Adolfo was nicknamed the German. I just feel like if we got together, we could figure out some kind of final solution <laughs> to this issue. Adolfo! <laughs> oh, they call him Fido. Yeah. Fido! That's good. Yeah, that's better. I yeah. think it kind of tells me that people were uncomfortable calling him Adolfo. You have a problem with this, my name? What does it remind you of? <laughs> Something bad? I hate up here. I can't keep my, my mustache short, <laughs> short enough. I hate having a full beard that hides my most stellar leader-like mustache. That's another crazy fucking thing about the movie Alive's Ethan Hawke. He's, he plays Nando. Yeah. Very fucking, much. Uh, his trimmed goatee. The yeah, the movie. movie. He refused to grow a beard. Yes, he refused to grow grow a beard. Yeah, I read or about even, that. Or even put a fake beard on. Yeah, he's sexy. He, yeah, he definitely he said no. I must keep my sexy Ethan Hawke goatee. I'm Ethan Hawke. Yeah, <laughs> I have a goatee. It's Ethan Hawke, Guy Fieri, the guy from Pawn Stars. These are famous goatees. <laughs> but regardless of lineage, Adolfo realized they could melt snow by taking aluminum from the wreckage to make somewhat of a hot plate that could be warmed by. The sun. Yes. The melted sun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, most ingenious. <laughs> <laughs> the melted snow would then funnel into a wine bottle. And while it didn't produce enough water to keep everyone comfortable, it did hydrate them enough to stay alive. Just remember each sip as you take, you can sink the Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm. I'd argue that you thank the Allies for driving the Nazis to South America. Exactly. (laughs) Reason for the season. Now, to keep everyone distracted and occupied while they waited for rescue, Marcelo Perez split the survivors into teams. One would be in charge of medical needs. Another would keep the cabin clean and orderly, while the last would make water. But while water seemed like it was the easiest job, it was also one of the dirtiest because they had to find snow that wasn't polluted by blood, human waste, or airplane oil. It also came with its own challenges because they had to venture further away from the plane in thigh-deep snow. Rise from your grave. Now on the third day, everyone was starting to get a little nervous. Yeah. yeah. Because there was no sign of rescue. But... That was also the day that Nando Parado woke up from his mini coma, having no idea what happened. After he weakly asked where he was, someone bent down and whispered into his ear, Hey, buddy, I just want you to know, hey, okay, so like, things aren't super chill, okay? We're not at the game right now. Okay? We're in the top of a mountain. <laughs> But you scored all the points. You scored all the points. You're the number one. You're the number one guy. Your head's starting to a rock people. <laughs> yeah, but then he was told his mother was dead. Uh, and then he was told his sister was dying. Mm-hmm. And instinctively, Nando then reached for the wound on his head and pressed it, making himself gag when he felt the spongy sensation of shattered bone pressing against his brain. God, because your brain, I mean, how does that feel? Side story, LPOTL, gmail.com. Oh. Can you actually do that? Can it, does it, your, because your brain, doesn't have nerves. It's the stuff around the brain. Am I correct? I think so. I'm just talking to my ass. I wouldn't say, yeah, because yeah, because remember in Hannibal, 
when Ray Liotta I at the very Handel. end, he's sitting there and Handel's eating his brains and Ray Liotta's still going. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know what? That is fact. <laughs> <laughs> but shortly after Nando woke up, the survivors finally saw a plane flying overhead and saw another few hours later, then another. And these were the search planes that had been sent out to find at least the wreckage. And some of the survivors maintained that one of the planes had tipped its wing to signal that they'd seen them. But despite all their efforts, including writing SOS on the fuselage with lipstick and nail polish, it was impossible to spot the location that was rapidly becoming a hellish existence that would last far longer than anyone expected. Now, after they realized it was likely that no one was coming, some of the survivors wanted to make an expedition to find civilization. But due to the co-pilot's statement that they had passed Kodiko, they were operating on faulty information. It is worse that he told them where they were not. Yes. Additionally, the altimeter in the piece-of-shit Fairchild aircraft gave the wrong reading. It read 7,000 feet, which made the survivors assume that they were on the western foothills of the Andes. They thought they were much closer to Chile than they actually were. In reality, they were deep in the mountain range at almost twice that altitude. <sighs> to make matters worse, walking in the snow was, as I said, extraordinarily difficult in their weakened condition, which made a trek even a few dozen yards away from the fuselage an incredible effort. But this is also why you, when you jog in the wintertime, you burn more calories. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, because your body's trying to keep you warm. Yep. But again, Adolfo figured out that they could use seat cushions tied to their boots as snowshoes. One more thank you to the Fatherland. <laughs> <laughs> you can all remember who did this. I mean, maybe his parents weren't fleeing Nazis. Maybe. Because maybe there were Adolfo. <laughs> Yeah, from <laughs> Uruguay. Well, well, the reason why the Germans went to South America, we learned in the Mengele series, is because there were already a lot of Germans there. Yes. So it's possible. It's very possible. Maybe Adolfo was a family name. I do. Maybe he's just a fan. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but he was younger than World War II. <laughs> and his parents still named him after Hitler. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, well, I think it's different, though. Maybe. I don't know. We don't know if his parents named him after Hitler. We don't know. They, he's the same name. <laughs> it's a popular name. Oh, on it. It was a popular name because you went in South America. It, it was just, it was a popular name. And things changed over time. And also, Adolfo in Latin American countries is like, it's not, it it's doesn't have the same connotations as like Adolf does here in, you know, the rest of the world. Yeah, they loved it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Adolfo's cousin, Eduardo Strouch, who also was quite crafty, he made sunglasses to protect the survivors from snow blindness by cutting the sun visors in the cockpit and stringing them together with copper wire. But even though they were figuring things out, the situation still wildly swung from getting better to getting worse. It was always getting worse because the only way to get better is not be there anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's degrees. I argue it's degrees. On one hand, Nando's sister finally succumbed to her injuries and died in his arms on the eighth day. The people who were really hurt were starting to die. But on the other hand, some of the people who had injuries that seemed fatal were starting to heal and they were therefore able to help. It's about being young. Yeah. It really is about being young. Man, eight days it took for her to die. Yeah. yeah. Eight, That's eight, so and eight days awful. Eight days conscious, too. Very bad. Like, she was conscious. Yeah, she would go in and out of conscious, but she was like, you know, but just in there begging. Honestly, thank God Nando was there. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, and he was, that's what he said, too. He's like, I'm, I was glad that, yeah, he said he was glad he was there. Yeah. That left only two with truly serious wounds. And I'm going to do the best I can with these names here Arturo Noguera and Rafael Echevarren. Oh. Eh, best I can. Both had serious leg injuries, so Roberto fashioned hammocks that hung above the rest of the survivors inside the fuselage. The trade-off was that their wounds wouldn't be stepped on, because that was a constant problem. But they were colder at night because they didn't have the warmth of the other bodies. But even still, Rafael began every morning by yelling, I am Rafael Echevarin, and I will not die here! Hello! <laughs> I mean, that's fucking awesome. It's yeah, awesome. So no, it was inspira inspired everyone every fucking morning. Like, yeah! yeah. Until, of course, Raphael died there. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Hard. But he he the worst rooster of all time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but he lasted a long time. Mm -hmm. He lasted well over a month. Both of the guys did. That's so impressive. Yeah. Another source of morale was Gustavo Nicolich. Uh, this would be you, uh, Coco. The funny guy. The funny guy. 
He was the head of the cleanup crew. He told jokes and stories. He led them in games of charades to keep their spirits up as much as he could amidst the, you know, terror and misery. Lose, lose, or draw. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, eventually, like, they, they even had, like, they had inside jokes. They'd make light of the situation. Eventually, that would come later. Yeah, of course, they yeah. would figure out because... The human spirit does seem to enjoy a couple of gallows humor style interactions. How could you not? It was a it lot of gallows humor amongst these you, guys. You got to. You have to like, because yeah. if not, you're literally just going to, what happened to the Donner Party? This you show. You become a, a, a crawling group of mountain creatures. Yeah. <laughs> this show is proof that gallows humor is great. Yeah, mm-hmm. of course. And that's how these guys fucking survive. Yeah, you are you are correct. Yeah, because these guys, yeah, the, the Donner Party was definitely like just fucking ghosts. Yeah, because everybody, ghosts. they got to these, they were regular people people by the time they even you know not to spoil by the time they survived they they, they were still kind of normal whereas like at the end of the Donner party everyone was like ah, ah. well these guys weren't they were kind of normal yeah sure, uh, i mean sure, they sure, were sure. To, uh, it was traumatized yeah sure. they were traumatized like the for some of the guys for a little while afterwards like any t- if they were eating and anyone came near their food they'd be like get the fuck away from me oh I, you know i'm like, you know, like it's natural i'm kind of like that now but for most accounts what these guys said The first 10 days were the hardest of the entire experience, but partly because no one knew what the fuck to do. Yeah. And so as the first 10 days dragged on, the situation got more desperate. The only things they had to burn was whatever happened to be on the plane. And after all the wood was gone from just two fires, they burned $7,000 in cash for just the slightest warmth. And if that ain't a sign... That's like, that's like symbolic. Yeah. yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, just like what really matters. Yes. Most of them, however, had lighters and a shitload of cigarettes. See, Chile had a cigarette shortage, and most of the people on board were smokers. So they would brought literally thousands of cigarettes for a five-day trip. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it gives you something to do. Yeah. You're wearing a nicotine patch right now. Right now. And it's beautiful here. I quit eight years ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, now it's almost ten. When wow. I quit cig- yeah, when I quit smoking cigarettes, I'm still wearing step two. I hope yeah. none of these guys ever quit cigarettes. I no. hope they sm- I hope they still smoke them today. I hope so too. And, <laughs> I mean, because that's the thing. It is, you know, I used to always smoke just because I was bored and nervous. It gave you a thing to do. Yeah. And a lot of these guys chain smoke to the point where they had to ration everyone to half a pack a day. And even then, some of them went beyond that and begged the others to share. Which is probably why we could have survived. Yeah. In terms of lung capacity. Again, they're young. Yeah. But still, they're one. They're they're sitting there smoking, all as, right. And as far as I know, they never ran out of cigarettes. Wow, that's fucking good for them. That's like Hanukkah. <laughs> yeah. But the most pressing problem was, of course, food. After nine days, the food had all but run out. And while the shock of the cold, along with the fear and depression, had curbed their hunger in the first week, survival instincts were starting to kick in. So this is where the anthropophagy started. Just wait, just wait. <laughs> By Nando's memory, (laughs) the last real morsel of food he was given was near the end of the first week when the team captain handed him a single chocolate covered peanut, which Nando ate over three days. Like he was Bob Cratchit. First, it was the chocolate. (laughs) Then it was half the peanut. And then it was the other half of the peanut. Now, after the food was gone, they tried eating strips of leather torn from luggage because they'd all heard shipwreck stories where sailors ate their boots. I totally would have tried to eat the leather. Yep. The problem was that the leather was chemically treated, so eating it would have done far more harm than good. Yeah, it's not like back in the day was pure leather. Mm. No. But as Nando put it, there are some lines that the mind is very slow to cross. But when the thought finally did occur to him, it was with an impulse so primitive that it shocked him. That impulse, of course was the urge to consume human flesh. Now, the idea first came to him when he was staring at the leg wound of a young man lying next to him. The center of the wound was moist and raw, and as Nando smelled the faint scent of blood, he very simply realized that, hey, that's meat. I don't want to get there, man. No. Why not drink the blood? It's bad for you. I think drinking blood's bad for you. Well, because they had water. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, let him keep the blood. <laughs> <laughs> the blood is what makes the meat good. <laughs> Nando then looked up and saw that there were several others staring at the wound who obviously had the same idea. But even though they felt shame at first, Nando nor any of the others could deny that when they looked at human flesh, they now instinctively recognized it as food. It really is the Looney Tunes thing of like, 
seeing the other guy on the shipwreck island turn into a turkey. Yeah. Because you just are, the biological imperative begins. Yeah. Because your body wants to survive. Yeah, Your brain wants to survive. Yeah, it's that hierarchy of needs. It's, yeah. Your brain switches. Now, out of all the survivors, Nando was the most driven. If you'll remember, both his mother and his sister had died in the crash, and he was determined that his father would not have three people to mourn instead of two. He was going to get off that fucking mountain. See, I, it's so cool because, like, it really could have just, like, sent him into, like, crazy depression. He could have yeah. fallen like, apart. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, he used it. And so Nando took his friend Carlitos aside and told him that there was food right in front of them if they were willing to go for it. We're going to eat the airplane? <laughs> <laughs> we'll eat the mountain rock by rock, <laughs> and then we'll be on the flat land. <laughs> no, Carlitos. <laughs> Nando first suggested the pilot, because as Nando put it, he was the one who put them there, so he could be the one to help them out. Yes. Fuck yeah. And it's, see, a pilot would actually be pretty delicious, because they keep in shape. Mm -hmm. But not as much as the other guys. Pilot's not going to be in as big, good a shape as a rugby player. No. He went a little fat, but he also might be drinking less and smoking less. Pilots or, get hammered. Yeah, dude, no, pilot, I know. Pilots are a bunch of filthy drunks. <laughs> Side stories, LPOTL at gmail.com. Yeah, how, how often do you fly a plane drunk? <laughs> <laughs> well, after listening to Nando's argument in silence, Carlitos finally admitted that, my God, I've been thinking the same thing. Whoa. And so, after floating the idea to a few of the other guys over the next few days, they decided to call a meeting. Roberto Canessa took the lead and told the survivors that if they ever wanted to see their families again, they had no choice but to consume the flesh of the dead. Hey, I, what, I don't know what you're thinking hey, of me. Hey, <laughs> uh, well, uh. And he was absolutely right in saying so. It was yeah. the only choice. Yeah. Now, some put up a fight and others refused outright. But eventually, the justification, outside of pure survival, of course, came from the New Testament. One survivor claimed that he had prayed to God, and God had answered with this. He who eats of my flesh <laughs> and drinks of my blood will have eternal life, and I will resurrect him on the last day. Take and eat. This is my body. Yeah, all Catholics are cannibals. Yeah. yeah they eat that, Jesus every we already fucking eat, Sunday. We believe in sub transubstantiation. That was their exact justification. We yeah. eat the body of Christ, so therefore we can eat the body of our friends. Yeah, Joe. The yeah. New Testament really is like the shitty sequel. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the fucking... I view it as the... It's the Temple of Doom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it was decided that Roberto would take the, a piece of broken plastic from the windows of the fuselage and cut away the first pieces of meat. Y eso es cuando empezó el cannibalismo. Oh, ¿Qué? Eso. Oh, antropofagio, sí, estamos siendo precisos. Ooh, mm -hmm. Spanish. <laughs> if we're being precise. So basically, so that is when you just said it in a sentence in Spanish, and that's when the cannibalism started, but you actually meant the, the anthropophagy. If we're being precise. Because you're being precise in Spanish. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm correct in any language. See. Sí. So, without a word, Roberto walked up to a body whose buttocks was protruding from the snow. It's from Polish cemetery. Mm. <laughs> mm. I don't know about you boys, but I've been staring at it. Uh, you know, and they were like, all right, Carlitos. He knelt, and without knowing whose body they were about to consume, cut into the frozen flesh. Finally, he came away with 20 slivers the size of matchsticks and laid them out on the fuselage to dry in the sun. He picked up a sliver put it in his mouth, and swallowed without chewing. The flesh was grayish-white, tasteless, hard as wood, and so very cold. But before anyone else took a bite, they joined hands and pledged that if any one of them died, the rest would have permission to use their bodies as food. The only people who were off-limits were Nando's mother and sister, who ended up being the only corpses that were not completely consumed by the time the rescuer showed up, that rescue was still 62 days away. 62 days. Why not cook them with cigarettes? Because <laughs> I feel like you didn't want to waste the cigarettes. I feel like if I, if, I was, if I was on that mountain, still as heavy of a smoker as I was, and you gave me a choice and you said, you could either have cooked flesh or cigarettes. Choose. You would have chosen yeah. cigarettes. I would have chosen cigarettes. 
every time. Really? Yeah, that's I why chose you're cig- so thin. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> but I chose fucking cigarettes over food in college all the time. Yeah, yeah, as did I. So that's I, why I, I started Parliament Lights because they had that two for one deal. Mm-hmm. That's how they got all the smoking. I chose sleep over food. Yeah, you always mm-hmm. you taught me that uh, that skill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, when yeah. you're hungry, go to sleep. sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Anando said that once he had eaten, he felt a small glimmer of hope for the first time since the crash. From that moment forward, things were actually easier in spite of the horror, if only because something had calmed their minds. They were no longer out of their minds with hunger. They could think for the first time. It's, it's yeah, and the, but it's this next part is the worst part. I think yeah. I'd rather eat my mother than someone, than a stranger. But that's the thing, nobody was allowed to eat. The mom. the mom was just like, I just feel like this was like an emotional like line in the sand. But as far as like grossness goes, I would rather eat a family member oh. than a stranger. Oh. I actually oh. feel like it's it's technically, it might be worse for you. Oh, you think so? I think it actually would be worse like for you. Like incest yes. in, a, in a weird way? Well, I think that it, it might be. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. I think it might lead to more prion diseases. I do. I don't know. Maybe what's I'm a prion wrong. disease? It's a thing that you can get from eating like it's a it's, it's a protein based like aberration. People get it from consuming certain parts, especially if you, you end up in your brains. It can end up in certain parts of your meat, I believe. No, I know because uh, tomcats usually kill and eat the kittens uh, that you know, they are cats. father to. And uh, they, they're able to eat the flesh of their offspring. And that's Side fine. stories LPOTL at <laughs> Yeah. I don't think it matters. I just wonder. Emotionally, it matters. I think emotionally, emotionally that's Yeah, I'd much rather, yeah. Eat your mom. Shout out. <laughs> yeah, how America killed my mother. <laughs> now, cutting meat from the dead was by far the most difficult and unpleasant job, while also being the most important. The trade off was that the butchers, for lack of a better word, got larger rations. A certain amount of pilfering was also allowed, say, one piece in the mouth for every 10 pieces cut. One for you, one, <laughs> two for me. <laughs> Guess who was the lead butcher? Who? It was Adolfo. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, I would like to take the helm. <laughs> mm. Interesting that we don't have any ovens, but we still... <laughs> but I do like to see how they look very similar. Let's see if the insides of their butts are similar as so. well. Now, each corpse had to be dug out of the snow and thawed in the sun to be properly butchered. But since the cold had preserved the body so well, most, especially those crushed by the seats were in horrifying poses. Oh, you can't even believe how scary this face one is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and their eyes were still open Ugh. much of the time. As far as how they did it, three survivors formed an assembly line of sorts to deal with the horror. Large pieces were cut off the bodies by the first guy, who then handed the chunks to another, who would then cut them into smaller pieces with razor blades. The further down one was on the assembly line, the easier it was to look at the human flesh as simply meat, which was a little easier for these guys because Uruguay is heavy on the beef. Oh, yeah. A lot Mm -hmm. of South American cultures are heavy on them grilled meats. And so every day around noon, everyone was given roughly a handful of human flesh, about half a pound, which had to be consumed raw because, again, there was nothing with which to make a fire. But since there were still quite a few people, Almost every part of the body was eaten. The liver, heart, kidneys, and intestines were particularly important because they contained the most vitamins. But the line was drawn at the lungs, the skin, the heads, and the genitals. Yeah. Or at least that's where the line was drawn at first. Because the I wonder how you clean out the intestines. I wonder if you literally they have squeeze to squeeze them out. out. Yeah, they were that they did say specifically that they would squeeze out all the intestines um, to get you know whatever. It's like deinvading various- a shrimp. God, yes, it is. God, it really is. It really does. I don't know why this surprisingly doesn't bother me at all. Yeah, it's because you're a fucking cannibal. Because you've eaten a man. I'm certain you've eaten a man. I wish. <laughs> but since they had something substantial to eat, the survivors were now able to move beyond the mere act of basic survival. Searching through the wreckage, they found a small transistor radio. And after making an antenna out of copper wire, they were able to pick up Chilean stations. That, unfortunately, was how they got the worst news they could possibly get. They're doing a podcast on us. <laughs> <laughs> Just as they were about to turn off the radio, they caught a news report saying that Chilean authorities had called off the efforts to find survivors of the lost Uruguayan charter flight that had disappeared in the Andes on October 13th. So how many days in are, is this? Uh 
I don't know exactly how many days in this is. It's between 10 and 14. I yeah. Guess. So like, getting... they started eating each other early. They, well, well no, they ran not... out of food 10 days. Once they ran out of food, that was like their issue. Yeah. It's like, you know, and in the cold, I believe it ramps up the effects of starvation. As it does. Well. Yeah. 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 They, they started eating bodies at 10 days because they ran completely out of food at like eight or nine days. Okay. And they knew like, if we don't eat, we're going to, everyone, everyone's going to die within like, a day or two. Yeah. Yeah. At most, maybe three days if they were lucky. Perhaps a little tastelessly, the station followed the report with a song called Volver, which was sung by two singers who died in a plane crash in the Andes 37 years earlier. We are spinning into the clouds and <laughs> we are dying. Was, Everyone's eating their cousin. Uh, uh, and he's just like, I hate this song. <laughs> it, it was even more inappropriate considering that Volver is a beautiful, albeit spicy tango. Oh. Now, while Marcelo didn't want to tell the group because he thought it would destroy morale, Coco argued that it wouldn't be too bad just so long as they framed it correctly. See? Yeah. So Coco sat everyone down and said, and he actually said this, All right, everyone. Great news. Yay! <laughs> Great news. They've called off the search. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Boom! No. <laughs> Boo. Boo, Boo, Coco. <laughs> Boo, you, Coco. But after everyone cried, how in the living fuck is that good news? Nando stepped in and said that it was, in fact, good news because they now knew exactly what to do. If they were going to survive, they were going to have to save themselves. Wow. Ironically, though, the only person who had his morale destroyed by this was the very man who said that the announcement would destroy morale. Team captain Marcelo Perez. His spirit was entirely broken by the news because he'd placed his faith in God to save them, and that faith had been misplaced. He was also the one who had put together the match, chartered the plane, hired the pilots, brought their families aboard. Yeah, he's not ha he, he also blames himself, and it's got nothing to do with you, man. It's got yeah. nothing to do with you, but he never, his spirit never recovered. Yeah, um, I it, imagine. Yeah. Man, you, Worst party ever. Yeah. And yeah, he, man, it's not fun. Now, once it was decided that they had to save themselves, they began small expeditions to test just how difficult it would be to get off the mountain. The first expedition, of course, almost resulted in the deaths of three survivors. After a single night, the explorers returned to the plane shattered by the elements. One had almost gone blind from the sun glare because his sunglasses broke. Another felt his teeth coming loose from the first stages of frostbite. And all of them nearly lost their feet. The guy whose teeth were coming loose, like another, this is like another fucking level of horror. One of the guys had to chew up human flesh and then baby, baby bird, bird it. it into the other guy's mouth. Oh, wow. oh, man, that's a fucking bad job, dude. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But once they reported back what they'd found, it was nothing but bad news. First, they were totally fucked when it came to scaling the mountains. The slopes were far steeper than they seemed. Every step was equal to a hundred due to the thin air and the cold and the fuselage was nothing compared to what they'd experienced out in the open at night. Lastly, one of the expeditioners said that when he looked down from the crash site from even just a few hundred yards away, they did not make it far. It was nothing more than an insignificant dot, meaning that rescue was without a doubt impossible unless they found a way off the mountain themselves. God, this is a nightmare. Such a fucking, this whole thing, such a horrible fucking nightmare. And of course, things were about to get a lot worse. Yep. In case you've forgotten, this was the Andes near the end of winter. That, of course, meant avalanches. And that's where we'll pick back up for part two of survival in the Andes. I hear those sleigh bells jingling, jing, jing, jingling, 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 that's yeah. how you know if you're stuck inside the inside yeah, the if snow. The, if the uh, if your spit goes up like up your by your eyes, that means you're upside down, huh? Yeah. yeah. If you're in an avalanche, you're supposed the first thing you're supposed to do is supposed to spit. Either way, you're fucked. 
Yes, yeah. yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's no, not no. good. It's not good. So if oh. it goes, uh, if you spit and it goes down, then you know which way to go. Yes. You know which way to dig. Yeah, you know which way to go around. Interesting. Um, but guys, thank you so much. Uh, yes, yeah, next week we're going to complete this. I also want to I want to announce, number one, it looks like our Classy Night Out show on the 22nd is sold out. Sold hey, out. that's and, great. Uh, so we're going to have, can't wait to see you guys there. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I'd like to announce I made an appearance on the Scream Dreams podcast as a guest with my friends, Catherine Corcoran and Barbara Crampton. Uh, Barbara Crampton, a horror icon. Barbara talking about Crampton. Stuff. They're great. They're both, honestly, just a lot of fun. It's a really cool show. Like We had a good time talking about what makes people scared. Catherine's amazing. She's. A, I interviewed her. Yes. yes. Yeah, she's great. the subathon. Yeah, Barbara Crampton from uh, Reanimator, right? Yes. Ah, she's Barbara, incredible. Very icon. cool. Um, so go check that out. And uh, what you got? Uh, I'm uh, I'm going to be opening, uh, featuring for Jermaine Fowler on January 4th in Ontario, uh, oh, Ontario? Ontario, uh, California. Oh, good. Oh, yes, good, good, yes, good, yes, good, yes, good. yes, yes, yes. This is a real bad time to go to Ontario, Canada. Yeah, I'm not trying to go there. Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, but uh, California, it's only, it's like an hour east. So check us out there. That's going to be a lot of fun. Jermaine and I, I'm going to do like 20 minutes. Jermaine's going to do an hour. That's so much fun. It's yeah. going to be a lot of fun. Cool. Also, um, I just want to shout out Kenny DeForest. Good oh, our, our old buddy, uh, yeah. we could talk, I, uh, he, he got into a, he was in, and it wasn't a car accident. He, well, you know, it was, a, it was a bicycle accident and he, uh, he unfortunately passed away. He's an amazing comedian. One of the best friends of a lot of comedians. Um, he has a GoFundMe up. It's, it's sitting on my Instagram page. You can go there and send some money to his family if you want to, or you know what? Go watch his stand up special on yeah. YouTube. It's amazing. Yeah. I really loved it. It is so funny. He was, he was one of the funniest dudes I knew. And a good man, a very, um, very good man. He was very man. close to Kevin Barnett, you know, that so it's it really it hurts a lot. But go check out um Do You Know Who I Am, Kenny DeForest on YouTube. Yeah, and he's great. And um yeah. Also uh Sad to do this after this, but also you could rent my movie, How to Ruin the Holidays, and I'm currently in, I'm in a Christmas movie, so go check that out. It's yeah. on Amazon. And this show is actually ruining the holidays. It is. Currently. That's our goal. <laughs> That's our goal. Uh, <laughs> fuck Christmas. Uh, and uh, I hope that we have a happy new year. I like Christmas. I love it. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you both do. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, hail Satan. Oh, hail Gene. Hail Henry. That's Why? very sweet. No, no, it's nice no, that no. Did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? It's nice that You'll he did get that. next week. <laughs> okay, cool. It's nice that he <laughs> did right. that. Okay. As long as it's my turn next week, then I'm okay. Then I'm fine. Help me! I'm, <laughs> I'm alive! <laughs> For now. <laughs> Fuck. This show is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks to our ad sponsors. You can support our shows by supporting them. For more shows like the one you just listened to, go to lastpodcastnetwork.com. 